This is the BBC. For details of our complete range of programmes, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash podcasts. Welcome to the latest global news, compiled in the early hours of the morning on Thursday the 4th of January. I'm Alex Ritson with a selection of highlights from across BBC World Service News today. Coming up, the activities of Donald Trump's family are treasonous, according to a former member of the president's inner circle. The accusation prompts a furious denial. I think that is a ridiculous accusation and one that I'm pretty sure we've addressed many times from here before. If anybody's been inconsistent, it's been him. Certainly hasn't been the president or this administration. Also in this podcast, the latest on the Iranian protests. Have they now been quashed? President Macron of France promises new laws to tackle so-called fake news. Experts say the fix for a major flaw in Intel chips could slow down millions of computers. And after the Ethiopian Prime Minister's announcement that he'll release the country's political prisoners, we ask how far will the authorities now release their grip? Really and truly are all political prisoners going to be released. No one really seems to know how many there are and where they're being held. How is the word political prisoner, what does that actually mean? But first, it's the story that just won't go away, whether the Trump campaign colluded with Russia. Now a new book has added fuel to the flames with comments attributed to President Trump's former chief strategist, Steve Bannon. The book quotes him as describing a meeting between Mr Trump's son, his son-in-law and a Russian lawyer as treasonous. Unsurprisingly, it's been met by an angry reaction from President Trump and the White House spokeswoman, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, has vigorously rejected the accusation. I think um, furious, disgusted would probably certainly fit when you uh, make such outrageous claims and completely false claims against the president, uh, his administration and his family. I spoke to our North America editor, John Sopel, about the contentious content of this book. Steve Bannon, who was the campaign manager running into the final phase of the election campaign, who then became the White House chief strategist, the senior most important advisor in Donald Trump's ear for the first six months of his presidency, has turned round and said that a meeting that took place in June 2016, before the election, was treasonous and unpatriotic and a lot more besides, which I can't say on air. That is an extraordinary allegation because, of course, Donald Trump has repeatedly insisted there was no collusion with the Russians. And yet here we have the erstwhile strategy chief at the White House saying it was a treasonous meeting that took place and takes aim at the people at the heart of the Trump family in a way that means that Donald Trump will find it much, much more difficult now to say collusion, it's all fake news. And it's a knife fight, and it's a knife fight to the death. And I think it shows that you kind of don't go after family. And that is what Steve Bannon has done in fingering Donald Trump Jr., in fingering Jared Kushner in this way. And Donald Trump has said, you have lost your job and you have lost your mind. But he's also gone on to try to paint a picture of Steve Bannon as this marginal figure who really wasn't that influential, who really didn't have the presidency here who really wasn't in that many meetings where he was one-to-one -one with Donald Trump. Well, I think history will uh, debate that particular analysis of the importance of Steve Bannon. He was a crucial figure. He was sacked last August, but he still had the president's ear. And it doesn't matter what job title you've got or whether you don't have a job title. What matters is your proximity to power. And Steve Bannon, even on the outside, had proximity to power. Not anymore. And there will be people who see Donald Trump's response and they say, well, there's no smoke without fire. Well, I think it becomes much harder for Donald Trump to deny publicly. If you look at the campaign that has been waged, Donald Trump gave an interview to the New York Times over the new year where he said 23 times there was no collusion. There was no collusion. He kept on repeating it again and again. It is at the front of Donald Trump's mind. And, of course, some of the ideological outriders are saying, well, if it is all fake news and it's, there was no collusion, then maybe what you need to do is to fire Robert Mueller, the special counsel who is investigating this, which, of course, would be a seismic step to take. Donald Trump's going to find it very much more difficult to tell his supporters that it's all fake news when Steve Bannon, the ideological outrider for Donald Trump, has said what he has said. And finally, this line from Steve Bannon that 
Donald Trump Jr. will crack like an egg when he is on live TV with Robert Mueller. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, he's gone for it. I mean, Steve Bannon does not mince his words. I should say that if you look at Donald Trump Jr.'s Twitter feed, Donald Trump Jr. is firing back. I mean, it is the most remarkable spectacle. It's not unusual for political allies to fall out, to no longer love each other. But it's normally done in private, and you might get a little glimpse of the kind of discord that is going on. This is a knife fight to the death taking place on social media. There was a former president who said of his head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, that frankly it's better to have him inside the tent um, looking out than outside the tent looking in. That's not a precise quote, but it's close enough. Our North America editor, John Sapel. Now, are the convulsions in Iran over? The head of the country's Revolutionary Guard says they are. Major General Mohammad Ali Jafari has declared the defeat of what he calls sedition, the anti-government protests in towns and cities across Iran. Eric Randolph is the deputy bureau chief for the AFP news agency in Tehran. He's been reporting on the unrest and he told the BBC's Tim Franks about the significance of a day in which the authorities claim to have finally brought stability back to Iran. Today was about the regime taking back the narrative and trying to uh, establish its authority. And it, it did quite an impressive job. Uh, there were minimal protests overnight, but then this morning, huge rallies across the country showing how easily the regime is able to, to call out its supporters onto the streets. And in spite of what uh, opposition in Washington and elsewhere would like to think, there is a very sizable part of the population that is firmly behind the Iranian leaders and uh, they were able to show that today. In terms of the people who have been going out on the street to protest, there's been a, uh, there have been questions about exactly who they are and what their motivations have been. Are you getting a clearer picture? Not really. To be, to be honest, the reporting has been very difficult in the last few days. We are restricted in what we can do. What we know is that there is a deep undercurrent of frustration and anger over economic issues. That is widespread. When we talk to Tehranis, everybody has stories of highly educated young people who can't find work or people who are struggling with rising prices, things like that. That's very real and that's, and that's palpable everywhere. But the sense that we got and it definitely it was an, an, a line that was pushed by the regime, was that as the protests grew, they became more radical, more violent. And the numbers that the Revolutionary Guards chief was saying this evening is that only 15,000 people took part uh, nationwide. 15,000 people sounds like a lot, but you have to think that back in 2009, you were talking about hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people taken to the streets of Tehran. So the number's much smaller than that and potentially much more radical. And I think that violence maybe turned off a lot of people that would have supported the economic grievances. If, as you're suggesting, it is likely, if it hasn't already happened, the forces of authority do manage to reassert control pretty much in full, who do you think, amid the competing forces that that run Iran, who will come out stronger as a, as a result of this? It's potentially a blow to President Rouhani, who's liberalizing reforms, were a key target of the initial protests. People are very unhappy with the budget that he put forward a few weeks ago, which had things like welfare cuts and uh, fuel price rises and things like that. That really didn't go down well and may have been one of the key things that sparked this unrest. At the same time, there are accusations from Rouhani's camp that the, the protests were initially started by his hardline rivals in a bid to undermine him and then grew out of hand. And if that is the case, then he will be able to talk to his hardline rivals and say, look, you need to calm down with your criticism of me because look what you're creating. We need to work together on this. And that might help close ranks in the establishment and remove some of the pretty fierce opposition that he has faced from hardliners lately. But the question is whether he can do enough to placate the population. Even if the protests go away, the economic problems that drove them in the first place are certainly not going to go away overnight. And when you talk about the economic problems, I mean, I've heard that it said that President Rouhani, or under his government, inflation has been tamed to an extent. But what other issues are people having to face? The big one's unemployment, and he recognises that. People say as high as 40% for young people. 
Part of the Iran's problem is that it has a very good education system. Huge numbers of people go to university, more women than men, famously, but come out of university and can't get a job. So you have people who are PhDs having to drive taxis or have very precarious, very poorly paid jobs. That's the big one, and that's the, probably the hardest nut to crack. So what he can really do about that is, is hard to say, certainly in the short term. Eric Randolph from AFP. Yemen's bloody civil war has claimed thousands of lives, divided an already impoverished country and driven millions of its citizens to the brink of starvation. Last year, it was hit by the world's worst cholera outbreak. Now, another preventable disease has struck. Diphtheria, hardly seen in Yemen for nearly 30 years, has returned. The BBC's Nawal al magafi travelled to the remote village of Bet al-Habub, where more than 40 people have contracted the disease. In the morning sun, the village of Beit Halboub is a beautiful sight. It nestles in between mountains. Its terraced fields are a rich green. It's mostly been spared the violence of Yemen's civil war, but it hasn't escaped the consequences. The people in this isolated village, halfway between the warring cities of Sana'a and Aden, have endured starvation, cholera, and have received no public services for three years. Now they face a new and entirely preventable threat. I enter the house of 14-year-old Rahma. She shows me the inside of her throat. It's terribly swollen, with a thick yellowish coating around her tonsils. She has diphtheria, a bacterial infection of the throat. If left untreated, it can kill within days. It's been virtually eradicated in most of the world, but has now come to Yemen. Her mum, Um Ahmed, tells me how her condition deteriorated. At first, she had a really bad fever. Then someone in the village died. Suddenly, a second person died from a sore throat. My daughter was terrified. She said, Mom, my whole throat is white. It was so scary. When I see my children helpless and sick, it breaks my heart. My daughter will die, and we have nothing to treat her with. The outbreak has been made worse by the blockade imposed by Saudi Arabia. Only recently lifted, it's delayed medicines getting in. As we walk around the village, people tell me that the supplies that did make it here were taken by the Houthi rebels. As ever, it's the ordinary Yemenis who suffer. The only medical services in the village are provided by a Kuwaiti NGO. Hanan is the energetic local woman who runs their clinic. Because the nurses and doctors didn't get paid for months, so they closed it and left. That's why all these diseases spread, cholera, diphtheria, and many others. The nearest health center is an hour's drive, too expensive to reach for the villages of Beit Halboub. We travel there to see how it's being tackled. Uh, Diphtheria is transmitted through the air, one of the reasons it can spread so easily. As we arrive at the health center run by the charity MSF, we're given face masks, a limited form of protection. Sandra from MSF introduces me to 10-year-old Zainab, who has the disease, but she's on the mend. Her mother, Ghania, is sitting by her side. This war has starved us of everything. We must fight for food, water and medicine. Now we have nothing. God help us. This crisis, this war, it needs to end. It has starved us and made us ill with disease. We've been resilient. But now we can't handle anymore. Enough is enough. This war has brought Yemen to its knees. Airstrikes, starvation, now disease. The people here say all they have left is prayer. That report by Nawal al-Magafi. 
It was named the term of 2017 by one dictionary publisher and now fake news is to be the subject of a new French law. President Macron has said in a news conference that his government will pass a law to stop fake news during elections, even giving a judge the power to block offending websites. In the case of spreading fake news, it will be possible to refer to a judge to take legal action that, if necessary, will allow for the removal of the content, the delisting of the site, the closing of the account spreading fake news, and even the blocking of the Internet site. Mr Macron accused Russian media outlets of spreading falsehoods about him during his campaign for the presidency last year. And as our Paris correspondent Hugh Schofield told me, the law has one clear target. Well, uh, he didn't name any specific target, but uh, there's no doubt in anyone's minds that, he, that Russia is very much in, in, in his mind. We can all cast our memories back to a few months ago when he uh, welcomed Vladimir Putin here in France and took him to Versailles. And he spoke at the press conference, spoke standing right next to Vladimir Putin about what he regarded as the illicit use of news for propaganda purposes by um, media outlets such as Russia Today and Sputnik. Um, he didn't mince his words then. And so there's no question that when he talks about the need to toughen legislation in our liberal democracies, that, that um, Russia is primarily what he's uh, aiming at. I mean, I dare say he's thinking more globally and about this as a threat which is not going to go away, which is very much with us for the future and, and could have all sorts of perpetrators behind it. But, I mean, I, I don't think we should be any doubt that uh, he is with, you know, the other Western dem democratic leaders quite alive to the threat that they see that... Um, comes from Moscow interfering in the democratic process by the placing of fake news on social media accounts. But these are serious powers that are being awarded to the state and there will be people who are concerned about the potential effect this could have on you know, quite legitimate people who are just exercising their right to free speech. Yeah, I, mean, I think we, we need to put a couple of caveats in here. This is still very much in the preliminary phases of what he was doing was outlining the, the, the sort of broader ideas uh, that he will want the government to flesh out. This is the president speaking, and he makes it quite clear that he's not in the nitty-gritty of, of the, the wordage of a, of a law. It's more about the general setting the tone, and then the government steps in and, and, and works out the actual law. But uh, yes, I mean, of course, it is something which is going to be hedged around with all sorts of difficulties, not the least of which, you know, what constitutes fake news? I mean, it, it will require some someone to say, well, that was fake news, therefore the law should, needs to be enacted to punish or to uh, the injunctions should be imposed to, to stop it being propagated. Where is that boundary between what is fake news and, and what is real news? You know, we all think we can spot it, but in reality it might be a lot harder to enforce. Hugh Schofield in Paris. You're listening to Global News. The most important stories and the best interviews and on-the-spot reporting from the BBC World Service. Every weekend you can hear a review of the week's main news stories and why they matter. That's in the world this week and the programme is also available to download from our website www.bbc.co.uk forward slash programmes. Millions of computers around the world will have to take a security update which experts warn could make them run more slowly. It's because of a serious flaw which has been discovered in chips made by Intel over the past 10 years. Our business reporter Rob Young told me more. What we seem to know at the moment is that this problem uh, is with what's called the central processing unit. It essentially is the brain of every computer and the flaw uh, is, comes about in the way that software on a device interacts with that brain. And Intel has said that they will be uh, providing updates, as they call them, fixes, as we would describe them, over the next week or so. And it's been reported that that could lead to some devices running considerably slower as a result, perhaps 30% slower in some cases. Now, Intel has put out a statement uh, saying, contrary to some reports, any performance impacts are basically to do with the way you use your computer, not uh, anything to do with their fix, but they're saying that any slowdown should not be significant and would perhaps be mitigated over time. But if you use a device with an Intel chip in it, the chances are you will have to download some kind of patch or fix over the next 10 days or so. And this isn't just going to affect people at home. This will affect some of the biggest names in the IT world. Absolutely. For 
big companies with hundreds, thousands of uh, computers on uh, their desks. They will have to go around installing these updates. And the job for them is perhaps more urgent than it is uh, for the likes of you and I, Alex, because banks and others, of course, have incredibly sensitive information on their computers and on their servers. And they will want to make sure that their networks are as secure as possible to make sure uh, that this floor, this back door, which exists in some chips, isn't exploited by those who might want to, for example, take your bank information. And the share price of Intel has fallen significantly. Could this mean that it fears legal action? Intel has said that it was preparing to disclose uh, information uh, about this flaw in its chips at some point over the next week or so and had been working with other chip makers and software companies as well. Of course, in the United States, there is always, for all businesses all the time, the risk of a class action lawsuit, the damages from which can run into billions and billions uh, of dollars. But at the moment, these companies are trying uh, to patch up computers and try to stop any PR uh, nightmare getting even worse than it already is. One industry analyst described to me uh, today that this was the worst PR disaster they'd seen in the world of technology. Rob Young. Ethiopia has a reputation for being one of the most tightly controlled countries in Africa. But in a surprise announcement, the Prime Minister Haile Mariam Dessalen said he's releasing all political prisoners and closing a notorious detention centre. Following that announcement, just how far will the authorities now release their grip? A question the BBC's Tim Franks put to our Africa editor, Mary Harper. It is surprising, I think, to people inside and outside Ethiopia. Ethiopia is normally tremendously repressive towards anybody who expresses any political or other dissent. So for the Prime Minister to announce that all political prisoners are going to be freed is a huge step. At the same time, uh, there are lots and lots of questions. I mean, really and truly, are all political prisoners going to be released? No one really seems to know how many there are and where they're being held. How is the word political prisoner, what does that actually mean? So there are still lots of things that have to be answered. But just that announcement, and also the announcement that uh, they're going to shut this notorious prison in Addis Ababa, is also something that is really surprising and something unexpected and big for a country like Ethiopia to do. Well, given that it's a surprise, uh, maybe it's an unfair question, but why do you think this decision has been taken? I think there are two main reasons. One of them is that the Prime Minister, Haile Mariam de Salen, he succeeded from a very strong uh, ruler, uh, Mele Zenawi, who died unexpectedly, and he really has failed to get a grip on the internal workings of the governing coalition, which is splitting apart. So he has got groups within that, especially from the Oromo and Amhara regions, which are the biggest ones, who basically say you have got to make some concessions to these two massive ethnic groups. So I think partly... Because there have been huge protests. From huge those, protests from that have been going groups. on for more than two years and many people have been killed and thousands, if not tens of thousands, arrested. So I think he's partly trying to find find a way of getting a grip on the internal politics of Ethiopia and also um, a way of trying to placate those people who are just not giving up the protests. It might not be in the news so much anymore, but, you know, almost every week there are pockets of resistance of people still going out into the streets or showing otherwise that they're not at all happy with the way that the government is conducting itself. So I think it's basically trying to please the internal political machine and also the growing opposition within the country. But presumably there's also a, a constituency within the government which is in favour of keeping a very tight hold on security on the political space. Absolutely, and I think that's another balancing act that the Prime Minister's trying, trying to achieve. And certainly on recent visits to Ethiopia, I have seen the security forces being extremely heavy-handed with, for example, the, anyone who comes from Somalia who they suspect might be a bit of a troublemaker. You see... Um, you know, there are informants absolutely everywhere. People are afraid to voice their opinions. So it still is a very repressive place. And I think it would be wrong to say that just because this announcement has been made, everything's going to change in Ethiopia. And there are still, especially the old guard, uh, who 
want to keep a very, very tight lid on things. They also see all their neighbours are kind of in flames and they believe that the way to hold Ethiopia together with its very disparate ethnic groups and also for the Ethiopian economy to continue to make such tremendous strides, which it has been, they believe that they need to keep a very, very tight grip on the people of that country. Do you think in that case that this gesture from the Prime Minister is one that is born of strength or of weakness? That's a, that's a good question. I think it's probably of weakness. I think that those in power in Ethiopia are really shocked by the fact that these protests have been going on and on and on for now more than two years and that they know they have got to find a way of bringing those people in and trying to reunite Ethiopia, which is a country that has so many different ethnic groups and so many powerful uh, and angry uh, sections of the population, especially probably the Oromo people, who are the most numerous and also in many ways the most politically and economically marginalised. But now they've really shown their strength and that they're not going to give up. So I think that those in power know that they have got to start making some concessions. But whether they're going to do enough, number one, to placate them, and number two, whether allowing more political freedom and opening the political space is actually going to be something that's manageable. We'll all have to watch and keep a very close eye on that. Mary Harper. Russia is reportedly planning to deploy hypersonic weapons on board its latest submarines during the next decade. These would be the fastest ballistic missiles the world has ever seen. But the Russians are not the only ones developing them. China and the US are also aiming to be the first country to have them in an arms race reminiscent of the Cold War. I asked our defence and diplomatic correspondent Jonathan Marcus about these weapons. Hypersonic is a term that we're going to hear in military matters uh, very much over the course of the next, uh, well, the next uh, decade, really. It's going to be one of the real buzzwords. Essentially, people know about subsonic uh, planes, subsonic weapons that fly below the speed of sound. We're all familiar with supersonic uh, aircraft, again, missile systems that fly at supersonic speeds, which are essentially uh, above the speed of sound, maybe 1,000 to 5,000 kilometres per hour. Hypersonic, though, takes makes it a huge leap beyond that. You're talking about uh, weapon systems that could travel at over 5,000 kilometres per hour, maybe up to 25,000 at the highest range. And it means that these are weapons that are moving between one and five miles per second, an extraordinary speed. And just how dangerous are they? Well, they're hugely dangerous and they're hugely potentially destabilising in a strategic sense. Uh, there are a lot of different programs underway. What the Russians are talking about at the moment is essentially uh, a, a seaborne anti-shipping missile uh, which would be fired in this case uh, from a, a new submarine that's being designed. Uh, this could also be fired from potentially a whole variety of surface ships. And so you, one can imagine sea skimming anti-shipping missiles are a very common feature of advanced navies today. But to have a weapon that goes so much faster, is so much more manoeuvrable and so much harder to defend against would be a, a real leap forward. Presumably very bad news for any country that's just built an aircraft carrier. Well, potentially very bad news. Uh, obviously, a number of countries are developing these hypersonic weapons. Uh, the French and the Indians, interestingly, are also putting a lot of effort into this type of weapon system, uh, as are a number of other countries. Uh, the wider concern is their potential use as strategic weapons. By strategic weapons, you mean essentially ones which can long have range, nuclear... Long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles. So but instead with of... A, with potentially a nuclear weapon... At, with potentially a nuclear weapon on board. And of course the worry with these is that rather than following the path of a typical ballistic missile, the hypersonic glide vehicle would follow a completely different trajectory. It would literally glide along the edge of the atmosphere at a much, much higher speed, making many of today's ballistic missile defences probably pointless. And of course that raises all sorts of questions about deterrence, nuclear stability uh, and so on. Because so, you're saying essentially it would be impossible to shoot these missiles down. These would certainly be a game-changing challenge of a very different kind. Our defence and diplomatic correspondent, Jonathan Marcus. Let's end this podcast by considering the future of science. Specifically, at the start of a new year, we ask what scientific developments we can expect in 2018. Rebecca Morell reports. 
2018 looks set to be a bumper year for science, and here are some of the stories to look out for over the next 12 months. Mars. The US Space Agency is heading once again to Mars. Now, you might think, hang on, we've been to Mars quite a bit, but this is a mission with a difference. It's going to be the first to delve deep beneath the planet's surface. It's called InSight, and it's due to launch in May and arrive in November. And the plan is to set down a lander to study the red planet's interior. It's going to have a whole host of instruments on board, but my favourite is a self-hammering heat probe that will burrow deeper down than ever before. The Antarctic. Back on Earth, and British scientists will be leading an international expedition to a colossal new iceberg in the Antarctic. It broke away from the Larsen ice shelf over the summer and covers an area almost 6,000 square kilometres. And if you like your size comparisons, that's a quarter the size of Wales, larger than Rhode Island in the US, twice the size of Luxembourg, depending on which papers you read. Essentially, though, all you need to know is it's huge. The researchers plan to investigate the hidden marine ecosystem that's now been exposed by this shifting block of ice. Climate. In 2018, a critical new climate report is also due to be released. The International Panel on Climate Change will look at whether it's feasible for the world to keep global temperature rise to under 1.5 degrees Celsius. But according to many scientists, this target is looking less and less likely. So the report is also going to assess what could happen if temperatures rise beyond this threshold. The Falcon Heavy Rocket. Its launch date has been pushed back and back and DC, back. DC, verify F9 and Dragon are in startup. But at the start of the year, we should see the Falcon Heavy finally blasting off. LD, verify go for launch. Go for it's launch. going to be the world's most powerful operational rocket, and it's been designed by Elon Musk's SpaceX company. Its maiden voyage is going to be unmanned, but it has been designed to eventually carry humans into space, potentially for future crewed missions to the moon or to Mars. The kilogram. The trusty old kilogram is set for an overhaul. Until now, the standard mass of a kilogram has been defined using a lump of metal sitting in a high security vault in Paris. The problem is, every time it's handled, a few atoms are rubbed off and it's getting lighter. This difference is so tiny, it doesn't really pose much of a problem in daily life, say when it comes to measuring out the ingredients for baking a cake. But for scientists who really, really need super precision, it's a big deal. So instead, a far more accurate measurement will be adopted, this time based on the principles of quantum mechanics. So by the end of 2018, prepare to see the kilogram redefined. And finally... Mercury. For the European and Japanese space agencies, though, this year is all about getting to Mercury with the launch of the Bepi Colombo mission. Covered in craters, towering cliffs and ancient volcanoes. Until now, the smallest planet in our solar system really has been little explored. The new spacecraft, though, is set to change that and it's blasting off in the autumn and due to arrive in 2025. And because this is the closest planet to the sun, once it's at Mercury, it will be operating under scorching conditions. It's been designed to function in temperatures hot enough to melt lead. Rebecca Morell. And that's all from us for now. But Jackie Leonard will be back with an updated version of the Global News podcast for you to download later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered in it, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. I'm Alex Ritson. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>